Okay, we'll call this meeting to order at 7.01. First up, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Cutler. All in favor? Carried. Regular minutes uh, from the March 8th meeting. Do any errors, omissions? See anything, Craig? Oh, everything looks great. I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes as presented. <clears throat> All in favor? Carried. Okay, uh, first uh, delegation up is uh, the RCMP Detachment Sergeant Jason Kahn. Unfortunately, he will not be able to attend tonight. Uh, so we will move on to uh, Delegation 2. Um, Aaron Gregory from Gregory... Harmon and Associates. Erin, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Council for giving us the opportunity to uh, prepare the audit this year and for the staff for their help throughout. Uh, now the statements that you have are in draft form versus being finalized because I'm not allowed to release the final uh, statements until after Council approves them. In an in-person meeting, this is easy because if for some reason council doesn't approve the statements, I can take all the paper copies out or back, um, but I don't have that option with electronic copies. So assuming that council approves the statements, we'll send out the final package tomorrow um, and that will be done electronically. So um, I believe all of you have a copy of the statements and that most of you have gone through the statements uh, in detail with Blair. So tonight I'll be reviewing the highlights um, of the financial statements with you. So overall, our uh, first audit with the town went very well and we've issued a clean audit report on uh, pages two and three of the financial statements. Uh, this means that the financial statements are fairly and appropriately presented in accordance with uh, Canadian pu public sector accounting stand standards. So we'll just start our review with uh, page four, which is the statement of financial position. Uh, so we'll start at the top with the financial assets, which are economic resources that the municipality owns or controls that will be used to discharge liabilities. So at December 31st, 2020, uh, financial assets totaled 6.4 million. In comparison to 2019, uh, this is a $2 million increase which is due to an increase in cash and temporary investments of the same amount. So of the 5.5 million of cash and temporary investments, 1.5 relates to deferred revenue and is restricted. So under the liability section, uh, liabilities increased uh, by 3.6 million to 8.8 .8 million. Uh, this is a result of the proceeds uh, received for the long-term debt of 2.8 million relating to the new uh, multi-use building. Accounts payable and accrued liabilities also increased by about 450,000 due to the final costs associated with that building and were paid after year end. Uh, deferred revenue increased by 800,000, which relates to grants in the year that were uh, received but not spent on their related projects during the year and uh, as a result have not been recognized as uh, income yet. So overall, net financial debt increased from 907,000 to 2.4 million, which is an increase of about 5 point, or sorry, 1.6 million. Uh, net financial debt is the difference between the financial assets and liabilities and represents the financial assets the, vill or the uh, town has um, left over after it discharges its uh, liabilities. So the town is in a net financial debt position, which some people often uh, misinterpret thinking that it indicates that the, uh, the town does not have enough assets to cover off liabilities. However, long-term debt is to be paid out over the next 30 years, not all in one year. So in fact, if just the current portion of long-term debt was included instead of the full amount, this number would be in an asset position of about 3.2 million. The next uh, section of the statement is the non-financial assets. So these are assets that are constructed or developed that don't provide resources to discharge liabilities, but rather are used to deliver government services, which, are, uh, which include items such as infrastructure. 
So the town's non-financial assets are mainly made up of uh, tangible capital assets with a balance of 32 million and include items such as land, roadways, sidewalks, water, sewer, uh, buildings, vehicles, and equipment. So tangible capital assets have increased by uh, 2.66 million due to the additions during the year, the main one being the uh, multi-use building. So overall, accumulated surplus is increased by 1.2 million to just over 30 million. So moving on to the statement of operations, which is on page five, um, starting at the top, our total revenue increased uh, from 6.9 million in 2019 to 7.9 million in 2020. The largest variation from the budget was due to government transfers for operating, which is a third line down. And this is due to municipal operating support transfer grant uh, received in the year to go towards lost revenues and additional expenses relating to COVID-19. Uh, this grant was not included in the budget for 2020 as it was unknown at budget time. So total operating expenses for 2020 were 8.2 million and decreased by 2.6 million when compared to the previous year. The prior year included a loss of uh, disposal on capital assets of 2.8 million, which um, related to the disposal of the old elementary school. So if this item was not considered, the total expenses are very similar to uh, 2019. Overall actual expenses are very similar to what was budgeted. So the other section um, totaling 1.58 million includes government transfers for capital, which are grants received and spent on capital projects, as well as uh, contributions of uh, 219,000 for assets donated during the year. So this leaves us with a net uh, excess of revenue over expenses of 1.2 million. So in the notes to the financial statements, there's quite a few of them. So I definitely won't be going through them all in detail. They do provide some good information. Um, and there's just a few I wanted to highlight to you. Um, note nine on page 19 just shows a breakdown of your accumulated surplus. So your accumulated surplus at uh, December 31st is 30 million, uh, which includes 1.5 of unrestricted surplus 2.4 million of uh, restricted surplus or reserves. And the remainder of the uh, equity in is equity and tangible capital assets. So this shows there's approximately 3.9 million surplus to go towards future spending when restricted and unrestricted surplus are considered. Uh, the next note is uh, note 14 on page 22, which shows your debt limit and the debt servicing limit calculated as outlined by the uh, Municipal Government Act. Uh, so the note shows that the town has unused debt limit of 5.7 million and unused debt servicing limit of 1.3 million, meaning that even uh, with the new debt being taken on, the town still has plenty of unused room. So the average unused debt uh, limit for other comparable towns um, per information provided for municipal affairs uh, from 2019 was about 6 million. So it's pretty comparable. Uh, note 20 on page 24, uh, it was the last note I wanted to bring your attention to. Uh, so we added this financial statement for COVID-19, which basically says that the financial impact on the town is not certain at this time. So this is a standard note disclosure that's been recommended by the accounting stand board, standard standards board, which is why we've included it. So kind of taking overall financial statements, uh, we do look at some of the municipal indicators um, that Municipal Affairs has put out. Um, so note that these aren't part of the financial statements, but wanted to provide this information to council as we thought you'd find it useful. Uh, so these indicators review how the town is doing using various uh, calculations. And in some cases, we've compared to uh, some of the 2019 information that Municipal Affairs has released. Uh, so looking at 2019 figures, the only indicator on, on the Municipal Indicator list uh, that we saw a, a bit of an issue with was the infrastructure age calculation. So this is the amortized value of tangible capital assets as a percentage of original cost. 
And so the count or the calculation is triggered when the net book value is less than 40% of the total original cost. Uh, so the infrastructure age was 31% in 2019 and has increased to 33% in 2020, uh, meaning a slight improvement. So the main reason uh, this is in the lower range is due to the amortization rates the town has adopted. Um, so I would like to take the time to note that some of the older capital assets, as they're disposed, we will see this percentage increase. So an example of this is the old town hall, which has almost been completely amortized and will be removed in the near future. Uh, so that will improve this percentage calculation. So in consideration of the new debt, we uh, also wanted to kind of look at the municipal debt per capita, which calculates the long-term debt load that the town is carrying per citizen in the town. Uh, so in 2020, this amount was approximately 1,600. Uh, so an increase from last year of 1,000 and higher than kind of comparable towns with an average of uh, 1,200. So this increase is expected uh, since the town's long-term debt is increased by about 38%. So as that debt is paid down, that, uh, that will probably come more into line with the, the average. So overall, uh, the town appears to be in good financial conditions based on the statements and the indicators we reviewed. Um, the last item I wanted to address uh, was a management letter, which we're happy to report that nothing came up in the audit that would uh, result in a point, meaning that we didn't find any uh, internal control deficiencies. So well done. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Oh. Okay, well, that, that concludes my presentation. I uh, hope you got some uh, highlights out of it. <laughs> Well, I'm sure we did. Um, I think the re main reason for no questions is we did thoroughly investigate it uh, the other day. Marion, you, Marian, you had something you wanted to say? I just wanted to um, thank Erin for her and her staff's uh, work on the <clears> audit, <throat> and uh, they were great to work with, and we appreciated um, the insight that they had for us. So thank you very much, Erin. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure working with you guys. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, I guess we'll move on to the next item. All right. Um, did you guys need me anymore or um, I can say goodbye? You can say goodbye. Thank you very okay. much for coming. Well, Thanks, thank everybody. you, everybody. Goodbye. Take care. Bye. Okay, moving on to action items. Number one, request for decision. The 2020 reserve transfers, Marion. Yes, so the, um, a part of the draft financial statements that were presented to the council tonight included the recommended transfers from operating reserves to <clears throat> cover um, expenses that were incurred in 2020 that were budgeted, as well as uh, transfers to operating and to capital reserves of any of the um, budget allocations that were there was a surplus in. So we do require a motion of council for both the out of reserve funds uh, for operating and capital and then the transfer of unrestric unrestricted surplus to reserves. Um, the amount coming out is $186,647 and the amount being transferred back into reserves is $1,064,460. Okay, any questions, counselors? Yeah, this is where, <laughs> just a quick question. When I add on the first proposed resolution, when I add the 8903, the 684, the 104, the 96, I get 188,647. Okay, let me just double check that one, counselor. I did check the other one, I didn't check that one. The, the other one for the 1,064,460 adds up. You're correct. That should be 188,647. Thank you. Way to go, Craig. Yes, Craig. Good job, buddy. 
Okay, would somebody like to move the amended motion? For one, oh, Councillor Zimmer. <laughs> okay, question. Moved by Councillor Zimmer to transfer out of reserve funds for 2020 operational and capital purposes in the amount of $188,647 for the year ended December 31st, 2020 as follows. Transfers from operating reserves, debt reduction, 80,903. Physician recruitment, 684. Transfers from capital reserves, water and sewer, $10,494. Land and development, 96,566. All in favor? Carried. Next one up. Uh, to do a transfer of 2020 unrestricted surplus funds. Who would like to? Uh, Councillor Cutler. Are there any questions? Okay, question. Moved by Councillor Cutler to transfer 2020 unrestricted surplus funds of $1,064,460 to reserves for the year ended December 31st, 2020, as follows. Transfers to operating reserves, general $35,702. Debt reduction, $2,006. Aquatic Center, $10,960. Policing costs, $18,433. Trust account, $820. Office, $459. Fill dirt, $15,182. Museum, $21,300. Cemetery, $12. Planning and development, $147. Transfers to capital reserves, general 1,411, arena 27,480, fire truck 12,847, parks and pathways 844, water and sewer 586,642, land and development 272,394, garbage and recycling equipment 18,442, acreage assessment 650, Tamarack Subdivision, 401. Playground Rehabilitation, 798. Enforcement Vehicle, 32,167. Tax Recovery Land, 189. Cemetery, 5,156. Museum, $18. All in favor? Opposed? Oh, carried. Number three, news release, the Alberta Government Local Measures Statutes Amendment Act. Marion? Mayor, prior to that, we do need a resolution to... Um, oh, I, can, I got it, yeah. It was, I was just reading my uh, thing, but I missed, I skipped right over that one. Okay. We need a motion to uh, accept the audited financial statements for the year end, December 31st, 2020 as presented. Councillor Schlossberger. Question. Moved by Councillor Schlossberger to accept the audited financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2020 as presented. All in favor. Carried. And we need a motion for to appoint Gregory Harmon and Associates as the town of Claire Sloan's Auditor for the year 2021. Councillor Schultz, question. Moved by Councillor Schultz to appoint Gregory Harriman and Associates LLP as a Town of Claire Sloan Auditor for the 2021 fiscal year. All in favor? Carried. Okay, now moving on to number three. News release, Alberta government, March 11th, 2021, Local Measures Statutes Amendment Act. Marion? Yes, so this news release came out on March 11th, as you stated. Um, I wanted to bring it to council's attention. It does talk about the changes to MSI, but one of the other things that I want to bring to your attention is that they are also um, increasing the amount, the levy that is put on uh, 
phones for 911 service. And they are increasing that from 44 cents up to 95 cents per month. So that will be effective September 1st. Just wanted to bring it to your attention because it has an impact on our, uh, our citizens. Okay. Any questions on it? Okay, we'll take it for information. Number four, news release, the Alberta government, March 15th, 2021, holding elected officials accountable in Alberta. Marion. Okay, so the UCP government has proposed legislation under Bill 52, uh, which they've named the Recall Act. And basically what that does is um, it puts legislation in, in place that there is a process where um, citizens can remove elected officials, including members of the legislative assembly, uh, municipal officials, such as mayors, reeds, councillors, as well as school trustees during their term. Now, from everything I've been able to find to date, basically what would happen all, for uh, the municipal perspective is that residents would have 60 days to gather signatures. They would need to have 40% of the population of the municipality or ward in order for that um, process to be enacted. So again, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, I think there's some significant impact there. Um, you know, 40% is a significant number to collect signatures on. I guess my concern would be the, um, the potential upheaval that those types of petitions could cause uh, within communities. And so just wanted you to be aware of that. Any questions? Okay, moving on, number five. News release, Alberta government, March 17th, 2021, revitalization rural health facilities. Marion. Again, I'm bringing this to your attention because this news announcement has an impact on Claris Home. So uh, the government is putting some money towards uh, revitalization of some of the health facilities. And one of them in the Calgary zone is uh, spending $1.6 million to add an ambulance garage to the Clarison General Hospital. So that should be happening in 2021. Um, and that's, that's happening at the hospital, not where the ambulances are stored, correct? It says Clarison General Hospital. Yeah, it says that, so I wonder, because they're, I know the bay, as the ambulances grew in size, the bay they have does not work at all, so. Yeah, it's the, it's the garage out the hospital that they're expanding. That's good. That, that's, a, that's actually a good thing. So great. within this package, so we have the highlighted yellow part on two of four. If you flip to the next one, three of four, where it says another 10 million will demolish decommissioned health facilities in Clarison Edson. Is that part of the garage that's part of that 10 million or what are we demolishing decommissioning? That would be the office building beside the general, is it not? So they did talk about that one on the uh, care center property there, that old one that has got the asbestos in the old office building. Oh, okay. I, I mean, that was one slated for it, so I'm assuming that's in there to, to get rid of those buildings. That's that's the one I was assuming it was, because that's been about oh, 15, 20 years now. It keeps coming up for demolition and then taking off the list again. So. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay, moving on. Number six, correspondence. The Honorable Rick MacGyver, Minister of Municipal Affairs, changes to the Alberta Disaster Recovery Program. Marion. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is just a follow-up letter. We've discussed this disaster recovery program um, numerous times now with the budget announcements and the, the change in the funding on that to the 90-10 partnership. Okay, we'll take the rest for information. Number seven, correspondence, the Honorable Sonia Savage, Minister of Energy, a letter regarding Alberta's coal policy. 
Marian? This is a letter in response to our letter that we sent on January 29th. Uh, basically, it's just reiterating the provincial government's policy um, that they or position that they reinstated the 1976 coal policy and that uh, over the coming months, they will be having some public consultation mm -hmm. and those are to start on March 29th. So no further information on what that public consultation looks like, but um, we'll, keep, we'll keep an eye out for that. Okay. Number eight, correspondence, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, the Spring Municipal Leaders Caucus. Uh, this will be, I, I believe, we sign up ourselves, Marion. Is that correct? If you want us to do it, it's $50 for each member to sign, sign up for this. So if you want us to do it, then we can um, charge that through the town's credit card rather than you having to do that individually and get reimbursed. So if you can just let me know within the next day or two, then we can get you registered. There is some really good things on the agenda when I looked at it. I thought, um, especially on the Thursday and Friday where we've got some remarks that are coming from the leader of the opposition parties. And then also um, on the Friday, we've got uh, the Premier's remarks, we've got the Minister of Municipal Affairs remarks, and then there's an open dialogue with the Ministers uh, later in the morning. So, Okay, well you can put me, you can put me down if you'd sign me up. Okay. Anybody I'm, else want to mention it right now? Councillor Sloshberger? And everybody else, just let Marion know when you have a chance. Okay, moving on, number nine, correspondence, uh, AUMA, Intern Alberta Policy Advisory Board Survey. Right. The AUMA has put out a survey, sorry, it's for the Interim Alberta Police Advisory Board. Um, they're recommending that it only be filled out by one member representing the municipality rather than everyone um, doing that. So I guess we just need to uh, identify the person that will be filling out the survey on our behalf. I nominate Marion Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposers? <laughs> I'll be glad to do that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks. Number 10, correspondence to Claire Soam and District Health Foundation Annual Charity Barbecue, June 16th. Marion. So the request is before council to be able to have permission to use Amundsen Park uh, again this year for the Health Foundation's Annual Barbecue. It's a good fundraiser for them. They're anticipating that they should be able to move ahead with that. One of the concerns obviously will be COVID and any restrictions that are in place for COVID at the time. So if council is willing to give permission for the use of the park, I think it should be with the stipulation that all public health measures have to be adhered to. I agree with that. Yeah. Somebody like to make a motion? I'll make that motion. Question? Moved by Councillor Zimmer to allow the Clairsoman District Health Foundation to hold their annual charity barbecue in Amundsen Park on June 16th, 2021, should public health regulations allow it with the stipulation that they follow all current public health guidelines. All in favor. Carried. Number 11, correspondence. David and Shannon Yates, parking of recreational vehicles. Marion. Yes, yeah, so this is a letter that we've received addressed to council um, regarding the RV storage and the changes to bylaw 1711 regarding uh, unsightly premises. And uh, 
they are concerned about the uh, investment that they had in their property in order to allow for the storage of their RV uh, adjacent to their home. And so they're concerned about now not being able to do that. They would like council to consider whether or not, whether or not the bylaw is continues or whether there could be a grandfather clause included. Um, and also we have compiled because when the information was first released, um, we received a number of phone calls uh, at the office. And so I asked the staff just to track those phone calls. So as of yesterday, or as of today, I guess I checked this morning, we had 11 calls. Um, the majority of those, I believe seven or so of those were uh, people who were against the bylaw and the changes to uh, the RV parking. There was a, a couple who just had questions about what they would need to do to adjust their properties. Um, and then a couple that were in support of the bylaw. We've also included in the background uh, an email that was received. Uh, we were not given permission to uh, publish the names or whatever. And so that's been blocked mm -hmm. out, but the, um, the full information of their concerns as well they are opposed to uh, the, the changes to that bylaw. Comments? I appreciate the uh, office staff uh, keeping track of the uh, variety of phone calls of both for and against and, and some of the concerns, but uh, I appreciate people bringing their concerns forward, but. Mm. Anybody else? It's, it's, it's understandable that there will be some, some uh, citizens that have some concerns. Um, and updating this in accordance to uh, a lot of similar communities is, is that we've had requests for. So we'll, in, I'll, continue, I'll continue to take any, any uh, comments or questions that come, come forward to myself. I think that we talked about that one time. It's going to be a lot of that education piece around understanding why the bylaws there and, and and what regulations need to be met but i think a lot of education will and the more questions we get the, the easier it'll get out there if we ever get to have any open houses again this year it's something that we could put forward in an open house like add it to whatever agenda we're going to have at the future open house and so we can take more comments, but I think for now, I mean, administration is gathering comments and uh, keeping a log of them. And maybe you know, we'll have to see what happens in the future, how, how many people this is affecting and uh, something we'll, we can keep an eye on. I think one thing Mike touched on it, uh, Councillor Cutler, is education because uh, the people that called me, many of them felt that they weren't allowed to park at all in their front yards. And, um, a and then another common thing that came out was that we did this whole bylaw just to get the trailers off the driveways. Unfortunately, if, if, if we public, we, I mean, we have put that bylaw out there, but I think we got to do a better job of getting it out there uh, so people can read it. And it's, the trailers are a small part this was not initiated to move those trailers off driveways. It was to clean up the yards and, and derelict uh, cars that are sitting in yards and derelict trailers. And unfortunately, it's uh, one small part that people are commenting on and they're not reading any further. So education would be a big thing if we could get the bylaw out there and, and explain it better, that yeah, would help. I, I when I read, yeah, when I read the Yates's letter, 
my my perception of it is really responsible residents who did the protocol that they at the time understood to be appropriate. So my curiosity, considering the investment they've already made to make their driveway the way that it is, is there room for them or potentially other citizens who've done that? Is there room for negotiation or conversation about this? Marion, at your end, what is there? Uh, there's the, the bylaw can always be amended. That's entirely a council's decision. Um, so I would say yes, I guess, if council wants to consider that conversation. I think it, it's a little bit early to amend it. I think we should track this for a bit. Yeah. And maybe yeah. readdress it in a month or two months. Because we do have until October to see what the consensus is out there. But it definitely is something we should keep an eye on and address. Absolutely. I've only had a couple of people approach me and I, I got two of the probably luckiest people to approach me in town because they both have rooms on the side of their houses, like paved, so they could put it beside it. They were just unaware that that counted. They thought that that wasn't allowed. So once I told me, oh, if you beside your house, you're fine. So once they found out that, then they were fine with it. So I had... Mine are two pretty easy ones, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that plays right into what Councillor Cutler said at the start of this, education. Yeah. You know, if, if we can educate them more on that, because I know in my neighborhood, there's a few of them that, that are concerned, but their trailers are beside their houses and they're going to be fine. How does the education piece going to affect someone? And I'm just speaking specifically to that letter because they're the ones who wrote in. So do they just need to invest a whole bunch more money to make it amenable to what the bylaw says? I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that's something we'll have to discuss in the future. Okay. For now, I think um, it would be knee jerk reaction to change anything at this time, but I definitely would like to see this come back on council's table in six to eight weeks and and see how it's see how it's faring and, and at that time we could address situations like councillor schultz marion um one of the things we can do is um we can go to this particular property and meet with them and and see what changes would need to take place if any i'm not familiar with how the property lays out so um, that's something definitely that we could do administratively. Yeah, and that was going to be my comment is if the bylaw officer can, can uh, do site visits with folks that do have concerns. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that might alleviate a lot of the problems right there. Okay, so shall we leave it for now and we'll discuss this again in a future date? Unless anybody else wants to talk about something? Okay. Number 12, request for decision, the Alberta Settlement and Integration Partnership. Marion. So the town's application to the Alberta Settlement and Integration Partnership Rural Capacity Building has been selected for funding. I did bring it to Council's attention, I believe, last meeting or the meeting before. Um, so it's a 24 month project called Community Takes Root. And uh, the project is valued at $297,625. So there's a number of things listed um, within the grant application of uh, projects that uh, will be happening over those 24 months. And those are listed in your package such as an engagement coordinator, a diversity coordinator. Um, there'll be laptops and those kind of things uh, purchased. There'll be, they'll cover the costs of the lease downtown. Um, there's education and training components for the Economic Development Committee. Um, the library will be seeing some benefits where we'll be putting uh, um, different language books within the public library for to see those. Um, some Wi-Fi hotspots, a few things, uh, 
aquatic center is getting some funding out of this, the Economic Development Committee for multicultural events. Um, the town will get some funding to host two annual open houses on the topic of rural immigration. Um, Alberta Highway to the billboard signage, there's some money going towards that. Also to FPSS, the museum, um, and other events hosted by the town. And then also there's $26,000 that go directly to the town to offset some of our administrative costs. So this is a follow-up to our RNIP program. And um, one of the things the Economic Development Committee recognized was that if we were going to be um, bringing individuals into the community uh, through the immigration program, we needed to have some support systems in place to be able to help them integrate into the community. So this is just another funding source to help us do that. So what we require from um, council tonight is just to approve the final submission of this grant and um, direct administration to complete the grant agreement with the Ministry of Labor and Immigration. Okay, any questions? Councilor Schlossberger is making the motion. Yes, sir. Any, any questions at all? Okay, question. Moved by Councilor Schlossberger to approve the final submission of the Community Takes Root project application to the Alberta Settlement and Integration Partnership, Rural Capacity Building, and direct administration to proceed with completing the grant agreement with the Ministry of Labor and Immigration. All in favor. Carried. Okay, moving on. Request for decision, the station, Mac and Hall. Marion. Yes, so I will start by apologizing because when the motion was put forward uh, previously to terminate the agreement uh -huh. June thirtieth, I had not reviewed that lease agreement prior to that. So my apologies. The lease agreement actually runs till December 31st. And so the station asked if we if they could um, continue with that lease until the end of the year. There is a couple of potential conflicts because if things start to open up and the scout group wants to go back in there, um, as we explained before, there's the difference in the uses, there's a little bit of a conflict there. So um, there's a couple of options. First, we will need to rescind that motion from June 31st because we do have the lease agreement in place. But I think we can either try to find an alternative location for the scout group, if it perhaps uh, is able to start again, maybe if they're only meeting once a week or whatever they could meet at, at the new uh, multi-use facility. Um, or we could do the same thing for the station. So um, this, the original agreement from the town was that they could use Map and Hall free of charge perhaps we could allow that to happen at the multi-use, uh, which would have free up Mackin Hall for the scouts. So just a number of things there for council to consider. Um, and we'll have those discussions with them, but we are asking council to rescind that motion 21045, which terminated the lease agreement earlier than what the agreement stated. Who would like to make that motion? Councilor Schultz. Councillor Schultz uh, made the motion. Sorry, Councillor Zimmer. Uh, discussion? No, I I agree with it. I didn't realize that we had a the contract till the end of the year. So again, like I just like to piggyback off Marion and apologize for that. Okay, question. Moved by Councillor Schultz to rescind motion number 21-045 in regards to the termination and notice of the station's lease for Mackin Hall. All in favor. Carried. Moving on, information brief, assessment management training update, Marion. Yes, so the town of Clareson was involved with uh, asset management cohort 
um, out of Kinter Creek is where it was established. So that was ongoing in 2020 and now into 2021. We have staff who have been taking training within that. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring council up to speed. Um, some of the things they've been talking about, um, they'll, they'll be bringing forward some policies and um, looking for council support. So uh, there's a number of ob objectives that they would like to meet. And basically, the gist of it is just making sure that we have proper policies um, and uh, planning tools in place to ensure that we have proper investment in our infrastructure um, and that council has good information to deal with when we're making budget decisions and our 10-year capital planning documents. So uh, we will continue to work with that group, uh, we have Blair from the financial side, we've got Tara from the development side, and then we've got Mike from Public Works and the infrastructure side, all participating in that. Um, there will be at some point in time, a recommendation that will come forward with some of our policies that will ask for an asset management planning or what they call steering committee. And on that committee, um, we would be looking for, repre for representation from council. So just something for you all to consider um, as we move forward with this as to who would uh, maybe be best fit for that, that steering committee, so. All right. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we'll take that for information. Number 15, information brief, the utility rate comparison, Marion. All right, so this is a, a request that came from council, um, just wanted to do an updated comparison of utility rates. And um, I know that you've all received some feedback from the community with the changes that we had in 2021 with the um, removal of the five cubic meters per month included in the flat rate. Um, so just a little background on that. In 2007, uh, the public sector accounting uh, standards changed and they required at that time that we include our tangible capital assets in our financial statements. That wasn't done prior to, uh, to 2007 for municipalities. And what that did was it actually brought to light for uh, municipalities and councils the infrastructure deficit that was in place uh, throughout um, throughout Alberta and across across the country, I guess. Um, so from there, in 2013, the town of Clarison undertook a study with Aquaterra. Uh, at, at that time, Aquaterra identified a huge, like I said, infrastructure deficit, and made some recommendations about the um, the utility rate structure and how that should be amended. At the time, uh, the council of the day did not choose to, to implement any of those recommendations. Then again, in 2018, uh, we administratively had the conversation with council during budget of 2017 and 18 moving forward as to you know what we needed to do to make sure that we addressed our infrastructure deficit and um, at that time, we, also, we did an internal review. We looked at the Aquaterra report. We felt, and council felt at the time that that report uh, was much more aggressive than we were comfortable with. And so we looked at, um, at changing that up a bit. So as council is aware, we implemented some changes uh, over the last few years, we had a bylaw we proposed from 2019 through to 2020, sorry, 21, um, rate increases and changes to our rate structure, one of which was beginning to wean off of the, um, the per cubic meter inclusion in the flat rate. So uh, we did the comparison. Um, 
One of the things we want to we want to bring to your attention is that um, these municipalities are potentially also reviewing their rates and their infrastructure deficits. So sometimes it's hard to actually compare apples to apples, but wanted to make sure that um, that, that point was brought forward. So basically, um, overall, our flat rates are at the bottom of the comparison community. When we include consumption of uh, the five cubic meters, we still remain in the bottom half, but that quickly rises to the top uh, once we remove that usage. So we're not, I guess if you look at those, we're not significantly out of line with uh, most municipalities that we did the comparison on. So any questions? So I do have a question slash comment. When we brought this bylaw in for the water, was there also not recommendations from the provincial level about uh, not just recouping our costs for the, for the infrastructure, but in regards to grant and funding that we needed to prove that we were supporting and promoting um, the, uh, uh, what's the word, I'm, the conservation of water. And like it was brought down, like it wasn't just a money thing. It was brought down again on a piece of this, this bylaw was to promote uh, people using rain barrels, to promote people utilizing. It was, it was that conservation piece around, and, and our budgets were actually being looked at when we were applying for grants of what we were doing as a community to promote this conservation, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And that's becoming more and more apparent in grant applications um, where we have to show within the application any measures that we put in place for conservation. And one of the things that was interesting counselors is we actually had a higher rate anticipated over the period of time to get to what we thought we needed for full cost recovery because we anticipated that as we changed rates that there would be increased conservation because people would, would be paying for what they were using rather than just having an allocated amount. Um, right. What we found is that our consumption did not decrease significantly. And so we, from the funding side of things, we were able to actually pull back on what we anticipated our rates would have to be because our consumption remained higher, so. Right, so what I'm trying to say is if people have concerns about water in their lawn, we're trying to promote them not to use potable water that we're cleaning to use the rain barrel process or conservation. We can also have green lawns just with a better way of doing it rather than using the water that we pay to, to clean. Is that correct? Correct, and the other thing too is um, there's studies out there that um, that show that people are overwatering their lawns. That lawns don't need as much water as we and we think they do. And so um, that's another piece. And maybe we can do some additional water conservation um, education component as to. You know, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head, but right, the lawn doesn't need you know, two hours of watering every day kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's, uh, well, and even if we could bring some conservationists who would come, like, I mean, I know of one way is I put a rain, rain barrel out and I can figure out how to use a rain barrel, but I don't know other ways of how to conserve water, how to use it to the best of its ability. And, and that education piece, again, if we can, I mean, there's a lot of people who are concerned about brown lawns. I mean, if we can bring in some kind of information or a section in the paper of, hey, this is one way we can do it. This is one way you can utilize it. I, I don't know. I just, I mean, I hear a lot of concerns, but not a lot of solutions. And I just think that if we provide some solutions, maybe we can help it. Would it be possible to investigate, I'm with Mike, to investigate, you know, maybe a rain barrel program? I remember we talked about that too, but then we don't want to take away from local business and stuff or whatever about the rain barrels. I remember bringing in some rain barrels before or something when we first started this, but exactly. I don't know if we can start a program or if we can start, I don't know. I just, to me, there's, it, there's, there's a lot of struggles, but not a lot of solutions. So I don't know if we can help people find solutions, but. Well, can we, all, can we educate the public a little more through articles 
on the on our social media and on the paper like like watering watering at night watering like any uh, any gardener or landscaper will tell you watering during the day is not conducive to con conservation you should be watering at night uh, little mm -hmm. hints like that I'm sure there's a thousand little hints like that right. that we could find and possibly start publishing them on our uh, website and in the, in our uh, news release to the paper and yeah like usually you only need like the first obviously depends on what lawn and how much topsoil and stuff you have but you generally only need the first six to eight inches wet and then only about an inch of water on your lawn after that per week um, obviously it depends if you're on the east side of town and you don't get wind you may not need a full inch maybe you can get away with three quarters a week um, if you're on the west side where Councillor Cutler and myself are and where the wind breaks, you might need a little bit more, but for the yeah. most part, you know, you only need to water the first six to eight inches and follow it up by an inch a week. You don't need to water 14 of a 24 hour day. Yeah. And, and I mean, and that's, and, and, and you mean, you got a little bit of topsoil information and some education and, and, you know, I'm, I'm just a nurse who, you know, I know I put a rain barrel out there and run some water, but if there's other little tips that we can, I, I just, like we say, this education piece, I mean, there's a lot of frustration out there about the changes and, and the costs and stuff, but it's just more than the cost. There was actually pushed down from the province to make these changes. And, and if we can help promote the conservation, like we're supposed to, then maybe that's a part of the education piece. And, and well, and yeah, I think you're right. Part of the education has to be what's being pushed down from the government. Like, and that's why we are kind of ahead of the game a little bit. There's other towns that have done it, but uh, there's more towns now looking at doing this for the cost recovery because the grants are drying up. And uh, 10 years, 15 years from now, if we have to replace the main sewer outfall for the town, we're going to have to, if, we are, if we're not doing this now, we're going to have to borrow the money. I, I think we're conserving for the future this way we're saving for the future and we've got to find a way to to get all this information out to the public because they're they're not it's not just an increase in a money grab I, th I think we really got to get it out there that this is not this is not trying to make a profit off water I mean actually right. it's mandated by the provincial government that we're not allowed to profit here off water all we're doing is budgeting for replacement right and the other the other piece to that is the now correct me if i'm wrong but the money that's taken in through the water rates is also being put into a water and sewer fund yeah right it goes right into that for it's not being diverted to any other resources or any people need to know that that money for water and sewer goes back into water and sewer upgrades no well, maybe other, we um, maybe no we other should. programs no other stuff it's just so, I mean, that's that's important too, I think. Maybe we should try and um, have administration put together a newsletter on, like simplify it and, and, and explain all these items. Yeah, we can do that. I think, I think we did that last year too. Like, I think the one we did last year was good because we had an open house with the water, right? I yeah, and that, the, golf the open course. houses help a lot. Yeah, and, but I, I think we did have a write-up done about the water. And it does explain a lot about the conservation and stuff, but people forget and people... I mean, COVID's also hit a lot of people in a rough way where people are tied up and people are just cranky for sometimes being cranky. <laughs> yep. And, and it's, it's tough. It is. And, and I get it. And that's why I try not to take any of this stuff personally. But, but yeah, I mean, it's just, I think what we did have before, I think did explain a lot of it. But. Well, could, would somebody like to make a motion to direct administration to put together uh, an executive summary, Councillor Cutler, that we could publish and keep it in layman's terms? And because, I mean, that's a very good point you came up with. The money goes into a reserve fund strictly for water and sewer. And of, the, of the 1 million and 60, whatever the reserve transfer was tonight, uh, 1 million 64,000 of that reserve transfer, there was 586,642 that went into the water and sewer reserve. So that comes directly from those utilities. That goes to fund those capital projects. Yeah. And that's and important information that should be out there. And, and hopefully. Go ahead. 
Well, hopefully people understand we're not asking them to pay for more than their share of water. We're just asking them to pay for their water consumption. That's it. It's just what you use. You don't get anything for free. Just trying to convey that. To, we're not asking them for anything extra or special. It's you're merely taking responsibility for your consumption. Yep, I think that's, Is that, that right? sums it up. That sums it up, yeah. Exactly. And there's, when it comes down to the education portion of thing, there's enough links and websites that we can direct people to. Uh, so we're not reinventing the wheel with a five page uh, uh, handbook of how to save water. Uh, the Alberta government has a couple of great ones that'll teach you everything from putting a brick in the back of your toilet tank to a reduced flow shower head to realizing that as much as a 20 minute shower feels great you only need about four uh, so it's there's choices at that point Marian? Uh, uh, Marian? I was just going to say maybe as part of our weekly uh, news release that we put out that we could just have a conservation tips section and so every week we could just have a Here's another tip here, you know, one at a time. So it's not like having, like you said, reading a five page document that nobody's going to read. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So Thank we you. have a motion out there. Can I hear it back, Green? So, and I'm sorry, it was Councillor Cutler, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so moved by Councillor Cutler to direct administration to put together an executive summary regarding increase in water and sewer utility rates and provide an explanation as to the reasons behind the increases and to educate residents and conservation where possible. That sum it up, Councillor Cutler. You're on mute. Hey, all in... yep. Go ahead. I like it. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Carried. Okay, moving on. Information brief, the MD of Willow Creek subdivision notice. Marion. Yes, so this is just to follow up. We were circulated on the application for subdivision on the northwest corner of town. Um, and one of the comments that we sent back to the MD is that we wanted them to um, note that the extension of 59th Avenue was planned to go uh, past that property and asked that they move, uh, shift basically the subdivision 10 meters to the north to make sure that that road line alignment would take place in the future. And uh, we did receive notice that that was one of the conditions of the subdivision approval. So I thought we'd bring that to council's attention. Any questions? Okay, moving on. For 17 information brief, Fire Zone Transportation Society lease. Marion. All right, so uh, following the meeting on March 8th, uh, we notified the Transportation Society regarding the decision of council mm -hmm. for um, the uh, rental of the office space as well as the cost for the, um, the vehicles to be stored at our parking lot. Um, so the Transportation Society has discussed that. Um, they want to express their appreciation to Council for the consideration of, uh, they had proposed the $5,000 merely as a budgetary starting point for their, that they felt was reasonable within their operations. Uh, the board has decided that they will move forward with the rental of the office space but by leaving their vehicles at the current location, um, they'll actually save some additional money. And so that's their decision at this point is to leave the vehicles there and, um, and rent the office space from us. So. Sounds good. Um, they anticipate moving in, I should say May 1st is kind of the start date. We move in in April, so that'll give us about a month of getting our feet wet before we have other people in the building. Before you have company. <laughs> any, any comments, any questions? Well, I, I just like to go on record as saying I'm happy that um, 
the administration has come to an agreement with the Transportation Society. Uh, the Transportation Society is an important part of our community, although uh, it's not that well known, but um, it does a lot for the, for the uh, elderly transportation wise in town. And uh, from, from the looks of things, it, it has a chance to grow quite a bit more in the coming years. So I, I just like to reinstate how we find it very valuable for the town and we support it in any way we can. Okay, we'll move on. Number 18. Uh, the information brief, new council chambers, community room bookings. Marion. Right. So in the fee structure for the new building, we did note that any of our internal um, and external boards that have members of councils, counts, the can't speak, sorry, a <laughs> member of council appointed to that board are not subject to the rental fees for the, the multi-use building, but we wanted those spaces to have to be rented um, and booked. So we've set up a calendar um, for any bookings within there. We're asking council when you meet with your boards, if they do want to use the council room or the meeting space, uh, the community room, that um, they get the bookings done through, you can either contact Corrine or Tracy here at the office to make sure that those uh, are put into the schedule. So, okay. Okay. Any questions? Moving on, number 19, information brief, the MSI operational funding. Marion. Okay, um, so I reported to council at the March 8th meeting that our MSI Operating funding had decreased from 124,966 down to 36,400. At the time, I assumed it had to do with our equalized assessment, and that is correct. So, Municipal Affairs confirmed to me that the sustainability investment portion of our MSI was eliminated for 2021 funding. In 2020, we received $88,000 in that portion of the funding. How it works is um, you are eligible for the SI portion of the funding if your equalized assessment is below 60% of the average equalized assessment across the province. So in 2020, we were at 58%. So we were eligible for the funding. In 2020, 21's funding, we are at 60.7%. So we are not eligible for that portion of the funding. It, there is no sliding scale. It's just a, it, you're either below or above 60% and that impacts the funding. So nothing we can do about it, I guess. Um, but I, I just wanted to point out as well that Prior to our previous discussion here, we were talking about um, the water rates and, and you know, the, the dependence on, um, on those grants from other levels of government. And I think this is just one indicator of why it's important for us to not be dependent on those grants because it's out of our control what happens with those. And so I think for the community to be sustainable long term that uh, we need to have that consideration. So I agree. Okay. Number 20 information brief the municipal emergency plan council access Marion. All right, so Jason has gone through and updated the municipal emergency plan. Um, it is a living document. It's updated you know, a couple times a year. Uh, there's lots of contact information and those kind of things that get reviewed on a regular basis. Um, what we've decided to do, because we're trying to get away from paper copies of documents, is um, we're going to create a secure online portal, which we have created, uh, for council to be able to access documents that you uh, need to review or want to review on a regular basis. So 
um, Corrine will send you a link to that site and any documents from now on, we will load into that site and they'll remain there for council's uh, perusal at your leisure. Um, and rather than giving council paper copies of a lot of these documents, we're just going to upload them to that site. So you remember when you were elected to council, you were kind of given a binder of a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you won't get the binder anymore. You're going to get a link that says, here you go. Here's where your stuff is to find it. So, okay. Okay. Any questions? Nope. Information brief, the CAO report. Any questions there? Thank you. Uh, council resolution status, anything there? Very busy. Holy smokes. There's a lot of resolutions on there. Ooh. Busy, <laughs> busy. Boy. <laughs> I always feel bad when I, Corrine's name comes up 20 times or Tara's name comes up 20 times. I always apologize <laughs> when I send it to them. <laughs> it was a busy time there when you look at that, the number. Okay, uh, information items. Would somebody like to move to adopt the information items? I'll make a motion to adopt the information items as presented. Any questions on them? Very if not, all in favor? Carried. And a motion to go in camera, please. Councillor Schultz? All in favor? Carried. Camera off, please.